Once again, it would be tempting for me to claim all kinds of credit for test picking that song, which fit not only with what we're going to be talking about in the Gospel of John, but the reading that Doc just gave us, as well as um, uh, the children's lesson and uh, Psalm 111 and all that. And I had nothing to do with that. She chose that on her own. So God is at work, and I just love it when uh, Debbie and I have been doing this all summer, too, where we have no idea what each other's doing, and God fits it together rather wonderfully. So uh, the seed of Abraham, uh, going back to uh, this whole idea of, well, and what we sang about, the God of Abraham praise the great I am. In the Gospel of John, we're coming almost to the end of our study of the Gospel of John, three more weeks, including today, but we're in the 18th chapter today, and I'll read the first 27 verses, John chapter 18, verses 1 through 21. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it that you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you were looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers, with its commander and the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two very different declarations are going on here. One, a declaration of who somebody is, and the other, a denial of who they actually are and who they belong to, whose they are. And I think I want to cover these things in opposite order. I want to talk about Peter and his denial, and then we'll go and talk about Jesus and his proclamation of who he is, um, even in a relatively innocent-seeming way, carried great power. And we see that. Uh, This is an incredibly dramatic story. And even where we ended it, um, anybody who knows the story, knows that Jesus has predicted that before the rooster crows, Peter is going to deny Jesus three times. And Peter goes into this denying, denying, and at the final denial is when the rooster crows. And in the other Gospels, we get John's re- uh, Peter's reaction to this. Um, John leaves it out for some reason, but Peter's reaction to the rooster crowing as he runs away, uh, sobbing and weeping. 
I don't know if you remember the first time you were uh, tempted to deny something, deny your involvement in something. Um, the, the little tangent here is that years ago, way, way years ago, uh, I was working with somebody who was having a conversation, not with me, but with other people, about original sin. This was a group of zookeepers and vet techs talking about original sin, which is fascinating in and of itself. More so because they didn't care what I thought about it. They were having a conversation. But what I will always remember my friend Aaron saying is, how is it that people can say that there is such a thing as original sin? You know, how can you say about this baby that this baby is not innocent, that this baby is somehow sinful? And I agree that when we look on babies, and we've got several young ones with us here today, it is very hard to come up with a concept of original sin from that. It doesn't take very awfully long, unfortunately, to find out that you do not need to teach your children to deny things. You do not need to teach your children to lie or to put blame on somebody else. It comes all too naturally to us, which is part of the concept of original sin. Do you remember the first time that you were tempted to say, I had nothing to do with this, push the blame off on somebody else? I was recently told, oh, now if I tell you recently, then you might know in various communities where that might be. So I'll leave it as anonymous as I can. Recently told about a family in which the middle child, and I being a middle child, I'm sensitive to this, is adept at pushing the blame off on the youngest child, on the youngest sibling, who is old enough to take up for himself, but nonetheless is always caught. When something happens, the middle child immediately puts blame on the youngest one, and the youngest one starts to sputter and get frustrated and flushed in the face, and that makes the mom think that he is guilty. The middle child told me this, only slightly embarrassed by this uh, particular ability because it's a talent, it's a skill. And I don't know if you remember the first time that you were tempted to say, I had nothing to do with this, somebody else must have done it couldn't possibly have been involved in this the first time that you were tempted to sell somebody out. See, when Peter goes into this conversation, it's not entirely fair. He is not asked from the very beginning, are you one of Jesus' disciples? It's in the middle of the night. He is scared. They have been rushed from the garden. His Lord and Master Jesus has been arrested. He doesn't quite know what to do with himself, and he's worried about where he is, right, on the, in the courtyard of the high priest. But the question is not, so do you know this Jesus? The question is, now you're not one of those, are you? Expecting him to say no. Far too easy the first time to say, oh, well, no, of course not. And later to think, well, that, that wasn't exactly right, but maybe I can correct it a little bit later. Last month when uh, we were traveling in Holland, we got to see two different sites of denials or betrayals, depending on how you want to look at it. Oh, high on my list was to take Sophie, since she's 12 now, to the Anne Frank house, and all four of us got to go. Waited in an incredibly long line to go to the Anne Frank house. Uh, this is the 70th anniversary of her turning actually 13, being given the diary, uh, which became famous as, almost as soon as it was published. Um, now it's been published into 40-something languages around the world, the diary of this young girl who had to go into hiding. A secret hiding place was made in the building where her father worked, and they were provided for by various employees of her father's company who were willing to risk, this is after the Nazis had occupied uh, Amsterdam, uh, were willing to risk pretty much everything in order to bring them food and keep them hidden. But somewhere along the way, somebody found out that there were people hiding, that there were Jews hiding in this uh, particular uh, secret passage that was hidden behind a moving bookcase, and they were betrayed. Somebody was not afraid to sell them out, uh, to let people know uh, to deny uh, the obligation they had to protect those in need. Well, then a little bit later, we got to go to Harlem, which is where the Ten Boom family lived, and we got to see the watch shop, the clock shop, in which the Ten Booms worked. Even Corey Ten Boom, uh, in her 50s, was working in this clock shop, and we got to go in behind it and into the house and there see another hiding place where the Ten Boom family themselves were hiding Jews, uh, trying to protect them uh, from the occupiers, and they refused to betray them, refused to hand them over, and for their refusal, they eventually also were betrayed and ended up in concentration camps. Uh, most of the family did not make it out alive. Peter is not trying to sell Jesus out, and he's not trying to keep himself out of trouble only, but you know that temptation, that great fear that I'm about to be in big trouble here, and what can I do, and is there some way I can possibly get out of it? And what is it we would risk and what is it we would dare to do in order uh, to protect ourselves? 
And Peter falls right in. And maybe, as I said before, the part of the problem was the way the first question was asked. Now, you're not one of them, are you? And you don't want to be in trouble. And you can rationalize that in all sorts of ways. I need to be able to be close to Jesus and maybe I can do something. I want to be close enough to hear what is going on. And in Luke's gospel, you know that at the third denial, as soon as Peter says with curses and oaths and swearing that he does not know this man and the rooster crows and Jesus turns and he's in a window and he turns and he looks right at Peter. Maybe Peter rationalized it by saying, if I can only get close, then maybe I can do something. Peter, who already had tried to act there in the garden, uh, he pulls out this sword. It's probably a very short sword or a long knife. And it's in the middle of the night. And even though it is probably a clear night because it's so cold and it's got to be close to the full moon. So there was some light. It's difficult to take a swing at somebody uh, with a sword. And Peter's a fisherman. He's not um, a soldier. He is not well acquainted with sword play. He struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. It's not that Peter didn't want to do anything, didn't want to protect Jesus. But finding himself in this position in the courtyard, uh, he was a bit at a loss. And it was all too easy to deny not only who he was, but whose he was. That very night, he had assured Jesus that even if every other disciple left him, he would never fall away. And he was willing to lay down his life for Jesus at that very moment. Simon Peter and another disciple, verse 15, are following Jesus. And because this disciple, this other one, was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard. Now, normally when John is talking about a disciple but doesn't name him, He's talking about himself, and he'll call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved or the beloved disciple. Uh, normally, if he is trying hard not to say the name of the disciple, then it's because he's trying to keep himself anonymous and keep Jesus uh, at the forefront. In this instance, I don't know why he doesn't name this particular disciple. Uh, unlikely to be John for a couple of reasons. He's very young. He's also a fisherman. He's from the north of the country. Pretty unlikely he would have connections so close to the high priest that he would be able to go into the courtyard. More likely this is one of the disciples from Jerusalem who runs in pretty impressive circles or once did. Known well enough to the high priest that he went without fear into the courtyard. And then was able to get Peter in as well. He came back, he spoke to the girl on duty, brought Peter in. But Peter is challenged as soon as he starts to go in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? And he may have thought, if I say yes, they'll never let me in. He may not have thought at all. Or he may have felt that chilling fear of, I am about to be exposed and what can I do? I must deny it. I am not. And it was cold. And Peter was already chilled with fear. And all of them stood around the fire and they were keeping warm. And then I love how John tells the story because he's going back and forth with Peter being tried by the crowd and then going into Jesus being tried by the high priests and others. The high priest questions Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching and Jesus refuses to give up the disciples. He won't talk about them and he has already demanded that the soldiers and the others let the disciples go, which they did. But while Peter's there around the fire... People are talking, they're gossiping, they're trying to figure out why they've been called in the middle of the night. This is not when you would normally hold a trial. It's not a time that the high priest, or the former high priest, uh, Annas has been high priest, or hasn't been high priest for a number of years now, but he was high priest uh, from 86 to 15, and they evidently went without one for a while, but then Caiaphas, his son-in-law, was uh, put, put into the position of high priest in AD 18, was there for 18 years until AD 36. Annas actually had a pretty high standing in society. Not only was, it, was he high priest, not only was his son-in-law high priest, but several of his sons went on to be the chief priest, the high priest. As they're wondering what it is that Annas is talking with Jesus about, they're talking among themselves, and somebody else asks Peter, you are not one of his disciples, are you? Again, expecting a no answer. Thinking he'd be crazy to be one of his disciples and be in this courtyard. He's already denied it once. Whether he thought more carefully this time or whether he was merely preserving himself. Maybe he thought he was preserving his position there in the courtyard. He denied it. He said, I am not. One of the servants, who happened to be related to the man whose ear Peter had just recently cut off, challenged him on this. Did I not see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. 
Well, there's a lot to contemplate about these denials uh, over and over again. Three times, the one who said a few hours before, I will lay down my life for you. Even if everybody else falls away, I will surely not fall away. And it would be easy, and I'm sure you have heard it before, uh, to take all kinds of lessons which are probably important for us to hear. But the easy and tempting thing for me is then to beat us over the head with this and uh, try to use guilt as a weapon and try to make sure that we know that we are never, ever, ever to do such a thing. Which, Lord willing, we would never be in a position where we would have to, one way or the other, choose to deny Jesus or to claim him. It's a crisis that came up over and over for the early church, by the way. Once uh, the church was officially being persecuted, not just by the Jewish authorities, but by the Roman Empire, the church had to deal with those who denied Jesus to save their life or the lives of their family, but then later wanted to be brought back into the fold, wanted to reclaim their position, saying, of course, I never meant it. And many of the creeds and councils of the church spent a great deal of time trying to figure out what to do with those who had once denied the faith. Peter is a good example for us. In lots of ways. I love Peter. I've told you that before. Peter always says the wrong thing. He jumps to the wrong conclusion. He is a man of action, not always a man of thought. And he often acts in the wrong way. And I hope that is good news to you and me. But one thing I will uh, challenge us with just a bit is this. In the whole tone of remembering who we are and whose we are. Peter called Jesus Lord and Master. And he belonged to him. But in that moment, in the dark night, in the midst of fear and uncertainty, he was unwilling to claim whose he was, to claim that he actually belonged to Jesus Christ. There is good news in that for you and for me, though, of course. He denied Jesus three times, and as we saw right after Easter, in the final chapter of John, in this conversation that Jesus has with Peter, three times Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the first time Peter answered boldly, and the second time he was a little confused, but he answered strongly again, yes, Lord, you know. And then finally, Jesus asked him the third time, and that hurt his feelings. Because Jesus had asked him the third time, Peter, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And for every denial, Jesus gave him opportunity to claim him once again as Lord and Savior. Because that is the Lord and God whom we serve. One who is willing to forgive and to reconcile and to bring us back, even though uh, we might fall. Remembering who we are and whose we are. Well, that brings us back to the first declaration. Not the denial, I am not, but rather this great proclamation of I am. Who is it that we belong to? After this long prayer, this high priestly prayer of chapter 17, where Jesus prays for himself, for these disciples, and for all other believers who would come after them, he leaves with his disciples. He crosses the Kidron Valley, goes down, and then up the other side. And on the other side, there was an olive grove, which is a strange translation. I don't think that's what your pew Bible has. I think it has garden. Um, this is the only place that we're told it's a garden. And in the other Gospels, it's just he goes to a place called Gethsemane. But here we're actually told specifically a garden, maybe a garden in an olive grove. And Jesus and his disciples go there because it's a place they've gone before. For you to get an appropriate and proper image of who it is that is to declare himself as the one who is the great I am, you need to think about how this evening has gone from John's point of view. The other Gospels, sure, as well. But John wants to make sure you remember one thing, and he brings it out uh, in bold relief over and over again. Jesus is not a victim on this night. Jesus does not go unwillingly. Jesus is not having to be hunted down and dragged to his death. Jesus is in control and master of the situation all the way through. He is claiming this destiny and claiming this road that he and the Father and the Spirit have worked out since before time began, knowing that we would need salvation and we would need a Savior. And he goes in majesty and in power to a death that seems ignominious and despicable and shameful. And it is a death that John sees Jesus uh, portraying as a glorified death and resurrection, certainly. Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place. So Jesus, knowing that Judas has gone to get the soldiers, Jesus doesn't take the disciples someplace where uh, Judas would never find them. He goes to the usual meeting place, someplace maybe they had gone every night since they'd gotten to Jerusalem. One of the places known to the disciples, Judas knew to look for him there, and Jesus does not hide there. 
Judas came to the grove and he's guiding a detachment of soldiers. These are Roman soldiers, by the way, along with the police from the temple guard, uh, these officials from the chief priests and Pharisees from the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. And they come at night and they come carrying torches, torches and lanterns and weapons to arrest this one man. A lot of fear and anxiety uh, in the air that night. Uh, Judas conflicted because he's about to betray his friend. These others wondering if they are going to catch this rebel, somebody who might soon start a rebellion but has not yet. Can they nip this in the bud? And they come not only bringing torches and lanterns, but they come bringing weapons. And Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out knowing what it would mean if he went out to these folks who had come to arrest him, knowing what the rest of the night and then the next day, Good Friday, was going to bring, he goes out boldly and he asks them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And this, you've got to picture this in your mind. I am not a big fan of most of the movies about the gospel stories. Uh, Most of them uh, leave a lot to be desired. But this is one that has stuck in my mind since childhood. And I don't know if my father ever explained it. But I remember this just uh, so profoundly. Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. And when he said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Did you ever wonder why they did that? They're coming in power with weapons. They don't know that at least one of the disciples is armed. Not much of a weapon against a whole detachment of Roman soldiers, professional soldiers. But why is it these people who come in all this state with all these torches and lanterns and weapons and a whole bunch of people to capture one man, when he says, I am he, they draw back and fall to the ground. I hope you've thought of that before. And I hope if you haven't thought of it before, that when I had Doc read that passage from Exodus 3, who is it, Moses said, that I should tell the people has sent me to bring us out of slavery, to bring us into freedom and to life? Who is it that I should say has sent me? And God says, tell them, I am has sent you. I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent you. We've talked about this at every I am saying of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the vine. You are the branches. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. All these great I am sayings that it is a powerful saying, not only because of the image he's calling to mind, but also because he's using this language, I am. You don't just find it in Exodus. You find it in Isaiah from chapter 40 all the way through 55 that God constantly declares, consistently and repeatedly declares, I am. It's divine Language. It's the language of God. And that's what happens to these people. They come from a position of power. The soldiers know their duty. They have done this before. They have arrested rebels before. They have fought against rebels before. They are not overly worried about what this might bring because they know it's going to be a small group and they have them easily outnumbered. And here they come with their weapons, with their authority, with their power. And this man comes out of the garden and he says, who is it that you want? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. Of course, they say with all power and authority. And Jesus says, I am he. And the only thing they can do is fall To the ground. It's not necessarily an act of worship, uh, but it ends up being that. The way that Paul says is that at the end of all time, every every knee shall bow on heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those in heaven and those on earth who belong to God, of course, will confess Jesus is Lord with rejoicing and celebration. Others will be bowing down and confessing that Jesus is Lord, not to their joy and delight, but to their fear and anger and frustration, particularly all those forces opposed to God's working in the world. I am he. And they fell to the ground. Appropriate. Falling before the living God who has come not to judge the world, but to save the world, Uh, not to defeat all these forces uh, lined up against him in this way, certainly not the worldly forces of soldiers and chief priests and Pharisees, but rather all that threatens us, body and soul, he has come to conquer sin and death. And the way he will conquer it is through his own death. I told you that I am he. And if you're looking for me, then let these men go. And they do. The co-conspirators, as they were um, no doubt termed, they let them go. Even after Peter cuts off the high priest's servant's ear, they let him go as well. And he shows up later at the courtyard of the high priest. Put your sword away, Jesus said to Peter. Shall I not drink the cup 
the Father has given me. And that should ring in our ears from the other gospel accounts of his time in the garden. Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass by me. But if not, let your will be done and not mine. They arrest him, they bind him, and they bring him to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest, who had formerly been high priest. But again... This is one who has come forward, who has offered himself up, and who goes willingly, even though they bind him, to this trial, a mistrial in so many ways, trumped up charges, convened in the middle of the night. Even this first encounter with Annas is illegal, uh, both in the way that it's been convened and then how it is conducted. And Jesus reminds him of that, gets in trouble for that, by the way. The high priest is questioning Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus said, I have spoken openly in the world. I taught in synagogues at the temple. I taught in public. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. I hope that makes you a little uncomfortable. We would not want to do that, right? We would not want somebody else to have to represent what it is that we once said, whatever it may be. If you ever have the opportunity to preach, then you will know this to be a fact. People are certain I have said things in sermons that I have never said. And they hear things that I never intended. Sometimes that's really good. Sometimes God's at work. And other times I think, oh my goodness, I can't believe that they just said that I said that because I never said that. Why does Jesus say, ask somebody else what I said, surely they know. What he is doing is saying, you are conducting a trial and you are supposed to bring witnesses first. You are not supposed to invite me to incriminate myself. Even in the first century, that was an expectation. So what he is saying is, where are the witnesses? He's not really saying that I want somebody else to tell you what I said, because I'm sure they'll do a good job. Because even the disciples always understood everything Jesus said about himself in the kingdom, right? They always misunderstood. Now what Jesus is doing is calling for a fair trial. Bring your witnesses if you're going to question me. And that's one of the reasons that the official struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. Bring your witnesses. But if I spoke the truth... Why did you strike me? Well, this is obviously not the end of the story. They go from here to Caiaphas, the actual high priest. It says the high priest that year, well, at the time this was happening, he was high priest for 18 years. And he's going to go before Pilate. So he goes from the church court now to the civil court. He'll go before Pilate. And then finally he will go on the road to the cross. Next week we will see his conversation with Pilate and then work our way up to the crucifixion in two weeks' time. What is it that John wants us to see here? Certainly the importance of Peter's denial, I am not, which in the early church and in the 20th century church and in the 21st century church is important for us to hear. There are people today, there are people this very day who likely will die because they are willing to claim Jesus is Lord and Savior. More people died for their faith in Christ in the 20th century than all the other centuries put together before that. It happens even now that people are asked to deny or claim Jesus is Lord the great good news for us and for Peter is the way that Jesus rehabilitated him. But the other important thing that John wants us to see here is this one who goes out to meet these arresting officials and soldiers. The one who goes their way even though they bind him is the one who has all power and all authority. The one who is going on his way, not as a victim to be a sacrifice only, but as a conqueror, one who will be the victor over sin and death. We are to remember not only who we are, who it is that God has made us, our individual skills and uh, talents and gifts and characteristics and attributes, but to remember whose we are. And we belong to the one who said, I am, I am he, Lord of all creation, Lord of the universe, Savior and Redeemer and friend. Will you please join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, our God, by your grace, help us so to live that the world may know that we belong to you, that we know whose we are, and that the world may know that we are yours. By the love that we have for one another, by the way that we live out good news in this time and place, shine your light through us and show your love uh, through our community and through our lives, we ask. But most of all, help us to see that this one who was crucified was the conquering king, going willingly to his death so that by his death we might live, and through his resurrection we might be your own. Help us.